Okay, welcome everybody. <laughs> uh, so I some I can't remember what it was, but I was supposed to announce something this evening. What was it? Oh, that was what it was? <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. About the deacons. So um, be praying about uh, nominations for the deacon uh, body. Uh, that's going to be coming up soon, nominations for new deacons. All right, if nothing else, um, we're going to um, at least talk about something here this evening uh, about uh, blood sacrifices in the t Ezekiel's temple during the millennial reign. And uh, so this is, hold on a second. here you go, Matt. Well, um, I think I'm going to start by saying this. The really, really good thing about this is at this point, we're going to have been raptured, spent seven years with the Lord, and when he brings us back, he's going to tell us what to do. And so we're not going to really have to worry too much about this, I don't think. Because I think that if he is, uh, uh, he's going to be there telling us exactly what he wants and how he wants it. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't take anything away from that it's here. But I tell you, there are so many different uh, opinions, thoughts uh, on this, many of which I just threw in the trash as fast as I read them. Um, I, 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 you know, I honestly think that there are, there are some good thoughts on both sides of this. I think there may be uh, and, and likely are ways that, that the God knows how he's going to reconcile these things. And, and maybe we just don't know yet, or a lot of us don't anyway. Um, but there are some, some issues, and people get upset about it. And so uh, right off the bat, I'm just going to say this, and, and I, this is what I would be worried about. Uh, as I try to do this, and I think what uh, any of you guys that want to study this, what I really would be worried about is that I would land someplace and say something that would take away from Christ. And, and it could easily be done. People believe that uh, strongly that if you've got blood sacrifices any time after Christ died, that that takes away from the glory of Christ. And it takes away from um, the fact that he did die for all the sins of all the people. Um, and so I want to just say up front that any interpretation, anything that we do with this cannot take away from Christ. I believe that wholeheartedly and 100%. Uh, and if it did or does, that we're dead wrong. So everything in Scripture, all the way from the very beginning, from Genesis, all the way to the end of Revelation, the whole thing is all about Christ. It's all about Him being the perpetuation for our sins, Him bringing us to Himself. Uh, and so anything that would take away from that, we better be careful of. Now, I don't necessarily know that that's true about blood sacrifices in the millennial, that it takes away from Christ. And there are many people who don't believe that it does. That, and so we're just going to kind of look at things today. I just, you know, maybe just give us something, some ideas, look at some scripture, read some scripture, and uh, kind of talk it over a little bit. And maybe, you know, I mean, not where I've landed, because I'll be honest, there are some folks that have studied this their whole lifetimes and have not really come to great conclusions on it in their minds. Uh, and so a few weeks of hard study is not enough for me to say I am any kind, anywhere close to an expert on this. So, but it is, I think, good to look at and just study on it and read it and see what the Lord says in these verses. So we're going to start reading in Ezekiel. And the question was not about the millennium. I'll tell you, this is one of the hardest things about this lesson was trying to stay on blood sacrifices and not get into the millennial reign as a whole. Kept wanting to run rabbits on the millennial uh, kingdom uh, and trying to stay tonight just talking about, mostly talking about blood sacrifices during that period of time. Uh, so uh, Ezekiel 43, starting in verse 18. It 
And he said unto me, Son of man, thus saith the Lord God, These are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall uh, make it to offer burnt offerings thereon and to sprinkle blood thereon. And thou shalt give to the priests, the Levites, that be of the seed of Zadok, which approach unto me, to minister unto me, saith the Lord, a young bullock for a sin offering. And thou shalt take of the blood thereof, and put it on the four horns of it, and on the four corners of the settle, and upon the border round about, thus shalt thou cleanse and purge it. Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin, of the sin offering, and... He shall burn it in the appointed place of the house without the sanctuary. And on the second day thou shalt offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering, and they shall cleanse the altar as they did cleanse it with a bullock. When thou hast made an end of cleansing it, thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish and a ram out of the flock without blemish. And thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priests shall uh, cast salt upon them, and they shall uh, offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Seven days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days shall they purge the altar, purify it, and they shall consecrate themselves. And when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day and so forward, the priest shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, saith the Lord. All right, so, I mean, if that is what you read in, in Ezekiel, there's uh, no doubt in your mind that there is absolutely offerings in Ezekiel's temple that he is talking about. Um, so the Lord, starting in chapter uh, 40, gives Ezekiel a, a very, very detailed um, picture of what the temple is going to look like. So detailed that not only does he take him and show him the temple, I guess we'll read that. Let's read uh, 40, uh, starting in verse 1. And this is, this is where uh, he's having, this, and this is a series of visions in Ezekiel. Um, and starting in verse 1, it says, in the in the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after uh, that the city was smitten, in the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. In the visions of God brought he uh, me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain, by which was, uh, was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man, whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. And a man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I show, uh, shall show you, for to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. And so God sends a vision uh, a man, an uh, angel that looks like brass, and he has actual, he basically, basically has a measuring tape in his hand. Uh, so this is how um, detailed, and we won't read the whole thing, but he begins then to tell in great detail how this Ezekiel's temple looks and measures everything. Measures the walls, the height, the width. Uh, he measures the buildings. He measures the inner he measures everything and tells the exact size. There are, are people who have built replicas of this. It's a beautiful, beautiful temple, huge temple. Another thought on this is that that temple, this temple does not have room to be built on the Temple Mount right now, as things stand. Um, there, there is no room for it. It wouldn't fit there. And the only thing then going from there, which you find... Uh, in scripture is that when the Lord touches down at the beginning of the rain, he touches down on the Mount of Olives and there's a great earthquake and the Mount of Olives divides and there is a vast valley. And so a flat area where I have to assume probably this very well could be built. And so, uh, so one thing that people 
one of the arguments against this is that it wouldn't fit where it's at, but I, I don't know that that's a great argument because I think that topography is going to change tremendously. Uh, I think scripture teaches us that things are going to change. It's not going to look the way it did. Uh, and there's going to be a big valley there that I'm, I'm guessing probably is wide enough to build this temple. Uh, so it will actually, you could actually build it there. And it is, you know, that's one of the things. I, I'm going to be honest. I, I, want it, I, want, I keep wanting to look at this. I keep wanting to say, you know, there's no way we're going to have sacrifices. No way. Jesus is it. You know, Jesus was the sacrifice. I'm reading Hebrews. But I have to agree that this looks like every other time God said build something, doesn't it? Every time when God said build a temple, every time God said build the ark, every time God said build anything, he laid it out for them step by step by step by step, just like he lays this out. Uh, this looks just exactly like he laid everything else out for them when he wanted them to build it. Um, and so that's, that's one thing to definitely look at. So I, I wrote in your notes here, uh, the, the main, and, and this is a big, big argument. I mean, the, the main thing that I saw was that there, if you take Ezekiel literally, then you have to agree that there are going to be blood sacrifices uh, in the millennial reign. I just, I, I can't get around it. There's the possibility, maybe, that we're... Um, that we've got the time frame messed up, but boy, it sure don't look like it to me. It looks like millennial kingdom. Um, and so if you have an inter a literal interpretation, and I told you all I tend to take the Bible literally um, if I can. Now, I'm not going to say that there aren't things. There are definitely are, is symbolism in the Bible and uh, allegorical things uh, in the Bible all over the place, um, but they almost always, I mean, they do always, uh, come back to some literal situation. Um, so I do tend to take the, the Bible literally. Uh, here's the thing, too. This isn't the only place we see references to blood sacrifices in uh, the Bible. I would, if this was the only place, I would probably go to chapter 43 uh, the, and, and see where... Um, it looks like he's saying, well, let's just read that. So uh, there's a place in Ezekiel 43, starting in verse 9, after he gets through telling Ezekiel all the dimensions of the, of, uh, of the temple, he says this, Now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Now, son of man, show the house of the um, how, show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the going out of thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and all the laws thereof and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form of it thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. So what you see right in the middle of this are a handful of verses that almost looks like a if. If they would do this, then this is the temple they would have. If they would turn to me, this is the temple they'd be able to sacrifice in. If they would turn to me and give up their evil ways, then I would build this. And we see this again through Scripture. We see God making promises um, if you will keep my commandments, then this is what we could have. I, I personally, if this was the only place where we find blood sacrifices, this was probably where I would land. It's saying that God was saying in this that if you would keep my commandments, you could have had a big, fine, beautiful temple and you'd have lots and lots of people coming um, and it, it would be, it'd be you know, just beautiful and wonderful and you'd be a light to the Gentile nations and everybody would want to uh, come to the temple. But what we do find is that there are other places where we find this. Uh, references in the book of Isaiah 56, uh, Isaiah 56, 7, uh, Jeremiah 33, 18, Zechariah 14, 16 through 21, and Malachi 3, 3 through 4. So we have multiple other places in the Bible 
where there, it really, I think it probably is talking about millennial kingdom and we have references to blood sacrifices. Um, now, the question then would be, why? So, the, the speculation that I've seen, it, it, it really do, it, it doesn't make me, you know, real strong, right? It doesn't make my feeling real strong about the whys. Uh, except that I do, I, I do lean toward the fact there are going to be blood sacrifices. Now, the why? Mm, it's tough. I mean, well, the main reason that I hear most people, people like John MacArthur, uh, say that it's for a memorial to Christ, that it's going to be, they're going to do animal sacrifices much like we do the Lord's Supper, um, and that it's going to be a memorial to what Christ did on the cross. And so they're going to offer these sacrifices to honor Christ and what he did when he died as the, um, the main sacrifice. Okay, so that's, that's probably the, the one most that I saw, that's, that's the, the stance most uh, commentaries, most of these preachers are taking. Another reason, and, and maybe to me, may make a little bit more sense, is for educational purposes. Uh, to teach the holiness of God uh, and that without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin. Uh, and so the, the thing that I think about on this is Ezekiel 44, 22. It actually says this. And so you read this, neither shall they take for their... Oh, is this the right one? That's not it. 23, I'm sorry. Ezekiel 44, 23. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. Okay? And so we actually see that part of these priests uh, of Zadok, part of their job is um, to teach the people right from wrong. Um, and it's hard for us, I think, as Christians in the church era, era to really understand the role of animal sacrifices in teaching right from wrong. But we, there, there definitely was in the Old Testament the idea of death being attached to sin. Um, and, and it's, in my mind, that is one of our problems today in America is that we've, we've sort of lost that attachment, right? Sin doesn't mean death to us anymore. Sin means Maybe a little shame, sin means somebody might say naughty, naughty, you know. Uh, and, and, even in, and, and even not even that a lot of times now. Sin doesn't mean what it used to mean because it's not attached in our minds to death like maybe it was to them. But it didn't do a lot of good for them either. They went astray from the Lord too, even though they were offering animal sacrifices. Um, but you do see that right here in verse 23 of chapter 44 that that they're teaching the people what it means uh what is the difference between the holy and the profane which is a a serious lesson that needs to be taught which brings us to the idea in the millennial kingdom that there will be a sin nature still with the people there uh, and so you're going to have two classes of people in the millennial kingdom you're going to have people uh us who have gone to be with the Lord and have got our resurrected bodies uh, in which there will not be sin, a sin nature, uh, and will rule and reign with Him. Um, not just the church age, but during the tribulation. You also find the saints who are beheaded during the tribulation, who also uh, are given uh, their, their bodies, their, their new heavenly bodies, and so they will also rule uh, and, and be in the millennial with us. And then you've got the people who, um, who go into the millennial still alive. Now, now the tribulation is going to be a horrible time. So many people, most of the people on earth are going to die. Um, the Lord's going to come back. He's going to destroy the armies, but there are still going to be people. And uh, from my understanding, when the Lord comes back, then he's going to have what he calls the sheep and the goat's judgment. And so he's going to take all the people who are alive after the tribulation and put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And the 
sheep are not going to be there anymore. He's going to destroy them, throw them out. And the people going into the tribulation, I mean, into the millennial, are all going to be people who are sheep. They're going to, the, the conditions are going to go back almost like it was in the uh, Garden of Eden. Um, people are going to be eating right, everything. There's not going to be things that's going to be, you know, killing them. The animals are going to, you know, the lion's going to lay down with the lamb. Lifespans are going to be long, so long that uh, I think it was Isaiah says that if, if a person dies at 100 years old, they're going to say he was just a kid, just a child. And so lifespans are going to be long. People are going to be having children, and those children, though, are still going to have sin natures and are going to have choices. Now, the Lord himself is going to be ruling with a rod of iron, the Bible says. And so this is not a time like heaven when all the people are doing right because it's in their heart to do right. Because they've been given their new bodies without sin natures, this is going to be a time when Christ is ruling with a rod of iron so that people uh, do right because if they don't, the Lord's going to punish them. And he's there to do it. Um, and they are going to do right for the most part. But you can't... You, you know, you, what's in a person's heart is what's in a person's heart. And so you can modify their behavior with a rod of iron, but there will be people who, who choose not, like, in, um, like the, the prophets talk about um, folks from Egypt not coming to the Feast of Tabernacles every year, and they're punished for it. They're not given rain uh, on their fields. Um, and so they disobeyed the Lord during this time. Um, and he rules with a rod of iron, and he doesn't send rain to them. So that would be a hard thing. Okay, all right. So there will be people there who have a sin nature, and, and they're going to choose again still. But they're, they're going to live a long time. They're going to live long lives, uh, and there's going to be a lot of people uh, born and living in this time, I think. And so they're going to need to be taught right from wrong. And the Lord's going to teach them. And it looks like he's going to teach them to some extent using uh, these, these animal sacrifices. Okay, and so then there's another thought out there that I'm, you know, I, I have a hard time with. And this one is that God still needs that blood on the altar and in his temple to uh, sanctify the altar to purify his surroundings for his presence to be in the temple. That's the one I sort of have some trouble with because Jesus uh, is the only forgiveness of sin. And so if he hadn't purified uh, the world, then the world isn't purified. And, and you see that all through the book of Hebrews, the idea that these blood sacrifices did not truly purify anything, that only Jesus purifies sin. Only Jesus forgives sin. Uh, and only his blood uh, covers sin. And so, I, I don't know. I have, a tr I have some trouble with that one. But there are a lot of people who think that's true, that God still wants the blood to purify the temple for his sake, uh, not being corrupted. All right, so I, I know it's not satisfactory. Hey, that's the best I could do on that part. We're going to go on into some arguments against uh, and mostly we're going to see this from Hebrews. We can go right over to Hebrews and read um, some stuff in Hebrews. And this is, I think, very important for us to keep in mind, even if it, even it, if it doesn't necessarily uh, wipe out the, 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 the idea that there are going to be sacrifices, I think we really have to keep in mind that those sacrifices do not take the place of Christ. Those sacrifices do not forgive actual sins. They do not save people. They do not sanctify their lives. And they're not going to send people to heaven. It's still through obedience in Christ. Uh, maybe not faith as we know faith, but it's going to be in obedience to Christ as their king uh, in the millennial kingdom. Uh, so it's still, everything is always attached to Christ. 
But we got some verses here that, that, that scare me on it. So we'll go over to Hebrews uh, chapter 9 and 10, and we see a lot of stuff about Christ being the last. And, and this is, this is uh, Paul talking about uh, Jesus and, and doing away with the old covenant of the law and sacrifice and making an argument that we don't need it anymore. Um, and so if you kind of hear what I'm saying and what Paul's saying, that we don't need those blood sacrifices anymore, it's hard to go back to it in my mind, right? From the church age, it's hard for us to, to justify going back when we've been reading Paul saying, hey, look, we don't need that anymore. That was old. It wasn't any good then. It didn't do a lot of good then. It was only done because God said do it, but it really didn't forgive sins. Um, and we read a little bit about that this morning. We got quite a few, a lot of verses uh, in the Bible that says that God would rather have obedience than he would sacrifice. Uh, and so in, in, it, it's hard not to go to that place where you say, well, if God would rather not have sacrifice and he's in charge, why would he have sacrifice, right? So it's hard not to go there, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more as we go. Um, let's see. I'm going to start reading in 9.16 and read quite a bit of verses here. I think they probably need to be read. Uh, read. For where a testament is, there uh, must also of necessity be the death of the tester, testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength uh, at all while the testator, testator lives. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, when, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and uh, scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the brook the book and all the people saying this is the blood of the testament which god hath uh, enjoined unto you moreover he sprinkled with blood of both the tabernacle and all the vessels uh, of the ministry and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood there is no remission so this is Paul saying that we're not doing away with sacrifice because we don't need blood. What he's really fixing to say is we do need blood, we just need better blood. Uh, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Know yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place, even year, every year with blood of others. Okay, so 24, and remember that, he says that Christ is the better sacrifice because we need a better sacrifice in heaven than we do in earth. Because he is the sacrifice and the blood that covers us in heaven, which is interesting. Okay, verse 26, for then must he often have suffered uh, since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So verse 26, that's, that's a tough one right there. When you, start, you take a look at that, it says once in the end of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to, he appeared in as a baby, lived his life, and put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was uh, once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Going all the way now, then you can look at this. Now we're it, it, it possibly... Okay, he is this great sacrifice, and we're talking about till he comes back. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make um, the comers thereunto perfect. The sacrifices um, never could make a person perfect. They offered them year after year after year, and it was only a shadow of Christ who was to come and uh, fulfill all things. 
For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the uh, worshipers once purged, uh, once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Okay? But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It's not possible. Not, and it wasn't possible and it won't be possible in the future. It says it's not possible. So obviously these, if there are blood sacrifices in the millennial, they don't take away the sins in themselves. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Jesus' body. You wouldn't have the sacrifices anymore. He prepared a body, Jesus. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, thou hast had no pleasure. He didn't take pleasure in them. Again, that makes me go to the place where if he didn't take pleasure in them, why would he bring them back? Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me uh, to do thy will, O God. Jesus came and did what his father told him. Above, when he says sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering uh, for sin, uh, thou wouldst not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away uh, the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will um, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And we see this over and over. I won't keep reading, but we see this over and over. Once for all, once for all, once for all. And so I just want to make very clear that no matter what the situation is in the millennial, that Christ's blood saves those people if they're saved. It's Christ once and for all who saves everybody. And he's the only one who can. Um, and, and it says, he, he's, and, and in other places it says forever. You know, those kinds of things. Uh, and, and we could go on. It, it goes on and on to the end of chapter um, 10. Um, so that's, that's something that I've just, I've got to say that because I'm, I'm scared to death I'm going to take something away from Christ uh, through, this, um, through this thing, and we can't do that. Uh, and so I just want to make very clear, and in other places in the Bible, that Jesus died for all men forever, and we see that wording over and over and over in Scripture. Old Testament sacrifice never forgave sin. Uh, God was never really happy with the sacrifices. He never accepted those sacrifices uh, if, if your heart wasn't right, if they were not given in faith in God, uh, looking forward to the, and, and just, I guess the idea is that when the Old Testament uh, folks offered a offering to the Lord, that they trusted God, that he would do what was necessary um, for that offering to mean something to them, right? And so they, they, couldn't, they couldn't make it mean that. Cain couldn't make his offering acceptable unto God. Uh, because he wasn't doing it for the right reasons and in the right ways. And so he wasn't honoring God, so his, his sacrifice wasn't honored. Um, and so they were always attached to faith, these sacrifices, uh, and faith in the Lord God. Okay, so another thing that I ran across, and I didn't see it in the commentaries, but I was just reading, and in John 4, 22... We see the Lord talking to the lady at the well, the Samaritan woman. And you remember what he told her. She says, I, I know that Christ is coming. And, and well, she asked him a question. Where, you know, you guys worship in Jerusalem. We worship on this mountain. And Jesus says to her, the time's coming when you're not going to worship in either one of these places. But the but God is looking for those who will worship me in spirit and in truth. And when I read that, you know, it kind of hit me as I thought about Ezekiel's temple um, that what God really wants is not some kind of sacrifice or religion or, uh, or, or some kind of ceremony so much. But what he really wants is people who love him and will worship him in their hearts and in their souls. Um, and he even says to her, there's going to come a time when you're not, no, you know, the true believers aren't going to worship in either one of these places. You're not going to be given sacrifice here or there. 
I guess that doesn't technically mean that you're not going to be offering them somewhere, but he says he's not looking for that. He's looking for people who are going to worship in spirit and in truth. Um, of course, that could be on into heaven, too. Um, another just a little thing to just say is uh, there are a few little things here that 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 just, just doesn't sound right either in Ezekiel 44 9 says that uh, thus saith the Lord God no stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel so again, here, here we find wording like the Old Testament, that, that in Ezekiel's temple, he's not going to allow anybody in that's not been circumcised. But I also see some New Testament talk there, because he says, not only in the flesh, but in the heart, where we see New Testament kind of talk about being circumcised in the heart. But it, do, it looks like he's talking about both, uncircumcised in heart and flesh. And we know that uh, in Scripture... Uh, in, the, in Paul's writings especially uh, we see that a person does not have to be circumcised uh, to be accepted by God that we're to be circumcised in our heart uh, made one of his through you know through the soul through the spirit and so not really sure what to make of that there are outer and inner courts I guess it doesn't necess- it doesn't come right out and say like the Old Testament um, temples that only Jewish men can be in the interior and then Jewish women and then Gentiles outside of that. In this one, we only have two courts. We have an inner court and an outer court. Um, I guess it doesn't necessarily mean that Gentiles are forced into the outer court and that women are into outer court. But I would say that probably... Um, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense that you go into the millennial kingdom with Jesus ruling and reigning and he's still separating people by male, female, Jews and Gentiles because we see that uh, in Christ we're all the same that we're all sa- saved the same way we're all of same equal value that doesn't mean we're all the same you know, physically but spiritually we're all the same and so it's hard for me to see going back to and it doesn't, and to be fair it doesn't actually say that the inner and outer courts are for that purpose. So, okay. Um, let's see. So I think I talked about the conditional promise in 43. Okay, so how can you, you know, some things that, that I thought about as I was doing this, y'all see that I'm, I, I seem like I am playing both sides, doesn't it? Yeah. Some things that, that I think maybe maybe these things can be reconciled together. Uh, Ezekiel thirty six. And verse twenty two to thirty two. Therefore, and this is a little bit before this, but this is still here, right here in Ezekiel before we get to this section on the temple. It says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, uh, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Um, and, and you can go on, and it, it talks about that they had profaned, that Israel was supposed to be God's chosen people, and were God's chosen people, and they were supposed to be a light to the heathen, and they did not do that. They profaned the name of the Lord. They didn't do what they were supposed to do, and so God says here in Ezekiel 32, 22, and through these verses, that he is going, uh, he was going to do this not for their sake, because they had, they had done good, but for his name's sake. You see, he's going to be sanctified as the world sees that when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. And so it strikes me that 
Um, maybe all this that's going to happen in the millennial is God saying, I'm going to take my children and I'm going to make them be what they were supposed to be. And I'm going to be glorified in that. I'm not going to end this thing with me choosing a people and then profaning my name before the world and turning down my Christ and crucifying him on a cross. And I'm not going to let it end like that. I'm going to take a thousand years and I'm going to bring these people back to me. And it's not for their sake. It's so that the world will see that my people finally know I, my son, is the Messiah. Right? That I am Lord. And I can see how that would bring glory to God. And anything that brings glory to God, I'm all for it, right? And so it strikes me that that very well may be exactly why we're fixing to, I say fixing, I, yeah, I'm probably fixing to do this, right? <laughs> probably soon. Um, I expect we're going to be raptured and have seven years, and I, I think it's going to be pretty soon. I think that it's for the Lord's glory. I, I think it's very, very likely that God is going to bring his people back. He's going to put them back to doing very similar. Now, it's not all the same. All the stuff that's, uh, all the offerings are not the same. The, all the things in the temple are not exactly the same. There are things that are left out. There are feasts that are left out. There's a lot of stuff you could probably go into. Uh, and it's very interesting that a, a lot of the stuff that's left out have reference to Jesus, right? And Jesus fulfilling some of the, uh, the feasts and the, the things that are in the temple. There's no Ark of the Covenant. There are no golden candlesticks. He's the light. He's the bread. There's no table for the showbread. It, it's, there's a lot of stuff there. That's very interesting that God, that Jesus himself has already fulfilled that won't be there. And so I think God is going to be glorified uh, in this. One thing that we have to remember is that Jesus is going to be there. He's going to be present. He's going to be ruling and reigning in his glory. He's going to be telling people exactly what he wants done and how he wants it done. And so we're not going to have to worry about it, right? All we're going to have to do is take orders, and that's exactly what we're going to be fit to do when we get there, is to take orders and do exactly what brings him glory. And he's going to tell us. Uh, I think this is fulfilling promises to the Jews, and it doesn't have a lot to do with us in the church age. I think that uh, part of our problem with this is that we, we look at everything through the church's eyes. Most of us in here have, have sit under preaching. We have... Uh, we have we have learned how to see the world through our time and place. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we're meant to do that. I think we're meant to see things. Uh, salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, that's the way it's meant. You know, that's how we need to see things. And I think that's the right thing. But I think it kind of, it may give us a little imbalance when we look at things like Ezekiel uh, 40 through the end of the book. And 1,000, um, here's another thought too. And, and some reason, a lot of people get this millennial reign mixed up with heaven. This is not heaven. This is going to be a good time. Things are going to be better. Jesus is going to be here. But he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. And there's still going to be bad folks around. You know, I say they're going to be disobedient. He's going to have to rule them. Uh, I think we're going to have to help him rule them one way or another. Um, but this is not heaven and this is going to end don't think that the millennial reign is the forever eternity a thousand years is like a day and so we think of a thousand years like this is going to be a long time we're going to have a thousand years of blood sacrifice well that's just like a day to God and then we're going to have eternity without them because there's not even going to be a temple in heaven in the new heaven and the new earth um, so just one thing to think about and, and so I think that they're going to serve a purpose and it's not something that is going to be established forever right this is not something this is something just for the these years and it's going to come to an end it's not going to be forever another thought that came to my mind is during this time there's not going to be a lot of blood and death people aren't going to see death they're not 
listen, they're not going to be watching bad movies. They're not going to be watching shoot 'em ups. John Wayne's not going to shoot anybody. And they're not going to see any real death and blood, really. I mean, very little death in the millennial. Most, most people are not going to see very much death in the millennial. A lot of people are going to live for a long time. Maybe this is uh, another thing teaching people that there is such a thing as death and that death is attached to sin. And they're going to need to know that. They're going to need to understand. And, and can you imagine if you'd never seen it, if, it, if, if people lived till eight, nine hundred years and you'd say you're, you're a hundred years old and you've never seen anybody die. Wouldn't it be kind of hard to link sin with death if you didn't know what death was? Just a thought. I'm going to end with this, and I'm going to say it again because this is my greatest fear. Acts 4.12 says there's no other way whereby men must be saved. People in all periods of time are saved by Jesus' work on the cross. The details, the circumstances, the time periods, things may change. But it's unquestionable through Scripture that there's one name under heaven that all people in all times must be saved, and that's Jesus. So, thank you, Miss Hillary.